Okay, kia ora koutou katoa, ko Danny Rutukuingawa. Uh, my name is Danny. Danny. Uh, thank you for taking up your time and attention to join us for another Toy 2 webinar. Uh, we've got a good little turnout today um, for our webinar on meaningful climate targets and action. Our key speaker today will be Dr. Belinda Mathers, who leads our technical team here at Toy 2. Uh, it's a very important topic as climate change makes its presence felt in Aotearoa. Uh, with abnormal amounts of rain and increasing number of floods, um, for example. So this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website by the end of the week. You'll be sent an email with further information. Uh, we will also be having a Q&A at the end. So please put all your questions into the Q&A section and not the chat section. Uh, you can then upvote on the questions during the webinar and this can help us prioritize answering the questions. We will be able to give written answers to some of these during the webinar. Uh, to start proceedings, we'll begin with a karakia. Kia tau nā manakitanga a te mea nāro ki runa, ki tēnā, ki tēnā o tātou, ki a mahi a te hui. Mā ki hiki hi, ki a toi te kūpu, toi te mana, toi te aroha, toi te reo Māori, ki a tūturu, Ka whakamaua ki a tina tina huie tai ki e. And with that, I will hand over to the good doctor, Dr. Belinda Mathers. Thanks, Danny. Um, I'm going to start today with a high level view of the science and progress internationally to set the scene. And then I will focus in on New Zealand and what we need to do here because that's what is most relevant to all of us. And I am very hopeful that my voice lasts out strongly through the webinar. I'm in the final stages of recovering from COVID. So my voice feels a little scratchy to me and I'm hoping it doesn't sound too scratchy to you. So the International Governmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, issues a suite of reports every six years or so outlining the current international state of the climate. There are three working groups uh, consisting of international climate scientists and others, and the sixth set of reports has recently been released. The working group one sixth assessment report was issued in August last year, um, and that covered the physical science, and there's been a lot of talk in the media about that already. Working Group 2 report was issued in late February of this year um, and focused on impact and adaptation. The Working Group 3 report was issued in April um, and that talked about mitigation and what we need to do about it all. So over the next few minutes, I'm aiming to give you an overview of the climate change impact in Aotearoa as they were outlined in the IPCC Working Group 2 report. In the near term, up until about 2060, <clears throat> climate change is projected to become an increasingly dominant stress on New Zealand's ecosystems and biodiversity, with some ecosystems experiencing irreversible changes in composition and structure, and some threatened and treasured sp species becoming extinct. Over the past 40 years or so, the snow line has risen by 3.7 metres per year. Over the past 40 years also, glacier ice spot volumes has decreased by 33%, and the area of 14 glaciers in the Southern Alps has declined by about 21%. In the Southern Alps, extreme glacier mass loss was at least six times more likely in 2011 and 10 times more likely in 2018 due to climate change compared to pre-industrial times. Climate risks are projected to increase for a wide range of systems, sectors and communities, which are exacerbated by underlying vulnerabilities and exposures. Extreme coastal flooding have increased due to sea level rise superimposed on high tides and storm surges in low-lying coastal and estuarine locations, including impacts on cultural sites, traditions and lifestyles of Tangata Whenua Māori in Aotearoa. Droughts have increased financial and emotional stress in farm households and rural communities. Tourism has been negatively affected by coral bleaching, fires, poor ski seasons and receding glaciers. Governments, business and communities have increased or uh, experienced major costs associated with extreme weather, droughts and sea level rise. All these impacts are expected to increase. 
The most recent Working Group 3 report uh, focused on the mitigation of impacts of climate change to achieve the goals outlined in the Paris Agreement. The Paris commitment globally was to achieve no more than two degrees warming with efforts towards 1.5 degrees. To achieve 1.5 degrees, our emissions need to peak no later than 2025, which is really soon, and reduce by 45% by 2030 and reach net zero by around 2050. Our current global policy commitments have us on track for around a 2.4 to 3.5 degree warming by 2100. A number of countries have peaked and are now reducing emissions, but unfortunately, New Zealand is not one of them. The report also told us that further investment in fossil fuels could trigger dangerous climate tipping points with positive feedback loops and irreversible climate change resulting from that. Fortunately, in the report, there was some good news. Costs for renewable energy have dropped considerably, which has opened up um, large scale opportunities for de decarbonisation. And there are op options across all sectors to at least halve our emissions by 2030 globally. There are also some strong links between living well and reducing our emissions, both in relation to active transport, moving from vehicles to biking or walking, and nutrition. In fact, Eating according to the New Zealand Dietary Guidelines can reduce food-related emissions by between 4 and 42% over current levels. The 4% reduction was just eating according to the National Dietary Guidelines, um, but including red meat and dairy and those sorts of things in your, your diet. And then there are a number of other scenarios that have been considered by these scientists, including um, up to vegan with no food waste, which was the scenario that gave the 42% reduction. So there are things that can be done, but it's not going to be easy. And before we start thinking that we can't achieve it, it's all too hard, it is really important for us to think about why we think we can't achieve it, whether it's technically not possible or whether we're just not willing to make those choices. So I'll talk a little bit more about some of those things through this presentation. Antonio Guterres is the UN Secretary General, and anybody that has um, been following the release of the third assessment, or the third working group report, will have seen his um, very um, impassioned speech, where he said that this report of the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change is a litany of broken climate processes promises. It's a file of shame cataloguing the empty pledges that put us firmly on track towards an unlivable world. That IPCC report also noted that the interact interaction between politics, economics and power relationships is central to explaining why broad commitments do not always translate to urgent action. So it's linking the, the commitments we make to the action we take that's going to make the difference. The Climate Action Tracker has some really good visuals to show what targets uh, countries have set versus what's actually needed to align with the Paris Agreement and avoid dangerous climate change. Just looking at the policies and action globally to date, we're looking at 2 to 3.6 degrees of warming based on their analysis. Taking, 2030, or taking global 2030 targets into account, we could limit that to about 2.4 degrees, the purple box that you can see there. Uh, while considering longer term targets brings that down to around 2.1 degrees of global temperature increase. The most optimistic scenario where all announced government targets are fully implemented and successful gives a lower limit of 1.5 degrees of warming. So we need to set somewhat stronger targets and then work very hard to make sure that they are achieved throughout the world. So our focus needs to be on delivery opposed to just target setting. It's not just about the targets. Now, looking at what Climate Action Tracker says about New Zealand, there's lots of negative stuff on this slide. <laughs> So as this graphic is showing us, up until now, New Zealand's commitments have not been enough. Our policies and actions to date have been setting us up for a four degree temperature increase, 
while the targets we've set would lead to a three degree increase. Even worse, when our fair share uh, based on our financial and other resources are taken into account, we've been deemed to be critically insufficient, which is the worst category. Based on our initial, our initial assessment at Toy2, our updated budgets will probably push us to the almost sufficient rating over the coming decade. So it is a really good improvement um, with the, the targets being set um, by government for the emissions reduction plan, but it doesn't look like it will quite get us across the line to be um, doing our share globally. But these international meetings, um, the conferences of the parties or COPs, are making a difference in terms of the pledges that are being made. Last year's um, COP26 in Glasgow um, did drive some really good strengthened commitments. So before COP26, it was looking like our um, 2030 global emissions would be about 52.4 gigaton compared to the latest numbers, which are showing about 47 gigatons for 2018. Um, and after COP26, we were um, looking more like getting to about 42 gigatons based on those pledges. However, um, they're well short of what we need to do to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, which is hitting that 26.6 gigaton by 2030. So we're going in the right direction, but we're not there yet. So what does 1.5 degrees or more of warming mean to us here in New Zealand? Uh, we're already starting to see weather impacts and social impacts, such as those that are listed on the slide, um, and they're going to get worse. So as storms increase in frequency and intensity, not only do we see flooding in our towns and not um, in the areas that we live in, we will also see more gaps on our supermarket shelves because the goods can't get to us and more issues with sourcing things like building materials and other raw materials. Our infrastructure will be affected and the health of both humans and other ecosystems will also be affected. We might not be able to farm in the same way in the same places that we do now because those crops might just not grow there any longer. You've probably seen attention in the media about New Zealand Sea Rise, a program comprising dozens of local and international scientists, including GNS Science and NIWA. The new projections are showing that infrastructure and homes in Auckland and Wellington and many other places throughout the country um, risk inundation decades earlier than was expected. Uh, this is because tectonic subsidence is contributing to our sea level rise. Some areas are sinking three to four millimetres a year, which is about the annual rate at which the sea is rising. So that halves the time that we have to deal with sea level rise. For example, uh, in just 18 years, uh, parts of the capital will see 30 centimetres of sea level rise, causing once in a century flood damage every year. And those that live in Ofero Bay and other places like that will really feel that. Previously, councils and other authorities had not expected to reach this threshold until 2060. So that's halving the time we have to plan for mitigation or retreat. Coromandel, Banks Peninsula, Hawke's Bay and Melbourne Nelson region are under threat too, along with South Dunedin and other places. When you look at where New, Zealand's live, New Zealanders live, you can see that there's a big overlap between the risk areas and the, the darker green areas in here where our population density is highest. So managed retreat and infrastructure upgrades will have a major impact on our lives. For iwi Māori, there will be many marae, urupā and other important places that are affected. We all need to work to minimise that impact. In terms of global emissions, we're sitting around number 70 in terms of total emissions, but 24 in term, 24th in terms of our emissions per person. If all of the countries below us on the, the list of emitters opted out of climate action or were slow to make changes, the impact to the planet and people would be significant. We all have to pull our weight together for this to work. And yes, a lot of our emissions are associated with our agriculture sector, but that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities to make a big difference across all sectors of New Zealand society. 
There are common arguments as well about how we deal with emissions that we import and export, such as the but our emissions are quite low once exported agricultural goods are taken out of the equation argument. If we looked on that basis, we'd be considering our consumption based emissions, which would need to in include the emissions associated with the goods that we import, which gets quite compl complex quite quickly at a national level. At an organisational level, it is well worth looking at the emissions of the goods and the services that you use, particularly those imported ones, because your purchasing choices can impact emissions of other countries as well as New Zealand. And to put things into historical context, New Zealand has a history of not letting the fact that we're small um, stop us from being leaders. Sir Edge, Jean Batten, Charles Upham and Kate Shepherd are both really good examples of that. So what should we be doing? There are different types of actions for different parties. So I'm going to look at the roles of government, of business and of individuals in driving our emissions, both locally and globally. We all have influence and there are things we all can do, but they're different things. The government has a key role in making it as easy as possible to make the right decisions for our environment. This comes from a mix of legislation, policy, funding and incentives, and of course, working to decarbonize the public sector, which has quite a large impact in our national footprint. Government also has a key role in ensuring that solutions are equitable with vulnerable sections of our society not becoming even worse off because of these policy decisions. The Climate Change Response Act is the framework for Aotearoa to develop and implement clear climate change policies. The Zero Carbon Amendment Act to that act uh, en enables policies that contribute to the global effort under the Paris Agreement to limit the global average temperature increase to 1.5 degrees um, above the pre-industrial levels and allow New Zealand to prepare for and adapt to the efforts of climate change. The amendment does some other key things too. Uh, it set domestic greenhouse gas emissions targets for New Zealand to reach net zero greenhouse gas, excluding methane, um, emissions by 2050, and to reduce our biogenic methane emissions to 24 to 47% below 2017 levels by 2050, including 10% by 2030. It established emissions budgets and it established the Independent Climate Change Commission to provide expert advice and monitor government climate change progress. New Zealand's first nationally determined contribution saw us committed to reducing greenhouse gases to 30% below 2005 levels by 2030 on a gross basis. This was updated having recognised that it was insufficient uh, in, 20, in October last year, 2021, with a commitment to reducing our net emissions by 2050, by 2030, compared to, 20, to, compared to 2005 levels. In gross emissions terms, that's a 41% reduction by 2030. But it is worth considering that a lot of that reduction may rely on purchasing offshore offsets if they're available. The National Adaptation Plan is currently in consultation, and that describes how we can adapt to and minimise the harmful impacts of our changing climate. This also includes managed retreat. So do have a say on that if you um, have comment to make. Our largest listed companies are also going to need to understand their emissions and their climate risks and have a plan to manage them in line with the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures or TCFD. So the government has done a lot and I'm sure they would list a lot of other things as well, but I don't need to list everything. One exciting thing that has happened this week is that our draft emissions budgets have been confirmed in principle up until 2035. The New Zealand Emissions Reduction Plan will be released next Monday, which is something that we're very much looking forward to. What we know so far is that the first emissions budget from, 22, from 2022 to 2025 averages at 72.4 megatons per year of carbon dioxide equivalent. We've been hovering around 80 megatons for the last few years. The second emissions budget 
from 2026 to 2030 has been set at an average of 61 megatons per year. That's 13.4 megatons or nearly 20% per annum below what we emitted from 2017 to 2021. And the third emissions budget from 2031 to 2035 has been set at 48 megatons per year, which is about 35% less than that 2017 to 21 period. So that's clearly an improvement in our emissions, but it may not be enough. And um, although the opposition has agreed in, um, with these targets in principle, these budgets, they are being debated in Parliament today. So that could be something interesting to watch. So that covers a bit of what government needs to do and what they are doing, and they're doing some good stuff. And going from one end of the spectrum to the other, individuals also have the opportunity to drive emissions reductions. Whenever you can, make decisions that factor in climate change, especially when it comes to your purchasing decisions. Not everybody has the ability to buy an EV or to buy premium low carbon products, but where you can, you certainly should. If the information isn't available to make good decisions, ask for it. The more consumers ask for evidence-based information about the emissions embodied in the things they buy, the more likely organisations are to provide that information and to work really hard to reduce their emissions. When it comes to elections, make your voice heard and make your vote count. And in terms of day-to-day -day activities, the biggest differences that you can make are how you travel and what you eat. Walk or cycle more, use more public and shared transport, and drive your fossil fuel car less. Eat less meat and dairy and more locally produced seasonal and less processed products. If you can buy things that were made nearby, you can reduce the freight emissions of the good you, goods you consume. The big topic for many of you will be what business can do and what business needs to do. We know that business has a lot to think about, especially at the moment, and that adding climate change to the mix may feel overwhelming. So I'm going to try to give you some ideas on where to start and how not to give up. The three big things you need to do when you're setting your targets and achieving deep decarbonisation will be covered in the next few minutes. Those three key points, which are shown on this slide, are setting strong targets, planning for barriers, and being accountable. And other things you can do are forming partnerships to share that burden. So you want to set strong targets or you wouldn't be at this webinar. What do they look like? Look long term beyond the sort of three to five year planning horizons that businesses typically use so that bigger investments and business changes can be factored in. EWE tend to be much better at, than other organisations at thinking about this really long-term view. And it's not unusual for EWE organisations to have long-term plans of 500 years. So we also need to consider the challenges, but don't let them put you off. Consider the mitigation hierarchy, where you avoid emissions by designing them out, then you reduce, and then you offset. Offsetting comes last on that list, and where you need to do it, it does need to be of high integrity. It needs to be real offsetting, um, real reductions. And do think holistically um, so that there are no unintended consequences of what you're doing. Science-based targets provide a clearly defined pathway for companies to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, helping to prevent the worst impacts of climate change and to future-proof business growth. Targets are considered to be science-based if they're in line with what the latest climate science deems necessary to meet the goals of the, the Paris Agreement, limiting global warming to well below two degrees below pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Companies can get their targets validated by the Science-Based Targets Initiative, or they can develop goals based on the concepts and guidance within that initiative. The underlying principle of setting a science-based target is that firstly, there is the carbon budget, which is the total amount of greenhouse gases that can be emitted before we achieve the two degrees warming, which is considered in this diagram as a bucket. The emissions scenario set out the forecast of emissions from the remaining budget 
what's the gap left in that bucket is in the context of, for example, social changes, economic drivers, and the rate of technology uptake. And the allocation approach looks at how the remaining budget is allocated across sectors, which helps organisations within sectors to understand how to apply climate science to their situation and set targets that will work for them. We can present a clear direction for organisations to follow by looking at those that are leading the way. And many of those organisations are involved in the science-based targets initiative. That can help fill the gap concerning the methods that we can use to meet those cl Paris climate goals. So setting the target, we've got to remember, is not climate leadership on its own. While it's an important step on the path to a livable planet, the real work starts after that. It's a bit like recycling, we need to do it, but it's not going to solve the problem on its own. So setting science aligned targets is all well and good in theory, but businesses have a lot of challenges facing them, especially at the moment with COVID economic uncertainty, supply chain challenges, difficulty finding staff amongst the things that businesses are trying to keep on top of. With all that, there's a temptation to put off the hard thinking about climate change, but I strongly urge you not to put it off as it'll just get harder the longer you leave it. So think about the barriers you're likely to face. Is there large investment needed to make the transformational businesses that'll cut your footprint? Is the technology not even available yet? Are there lower emissions raw materials or other inputs available yet, or are you still waiting for those to come? Do you have the skills and knowledge within your business to come up with a plan and to implement it? If you understand those things that are likely to trip you up, you can plan for them. You can get the resources in place and you can um, do the easy stuff now or the easier stuff while you put things in place for the next phase of your business transformation. Deep reductions won't be easy, and they're likely to require some transformational changes to your business. You need to be working with your value chain for them to reduce their emissions too. Most of our organizational impacts are likely to be upstream and downstream of what we do ourselves in our business from day to day. The raw materials that we use, the services that we purchase, the use and disposal of the products that we make and sell, all have significant impacts, and we need to play our part in reducing those impacts. Offsetting is part of the answer, especially in the short term, but more and more we are hearing that just offsetting without reducing emissions is not okay. There's a lot to do, but taking one step at a time and planning those steps well are key. And prepare for some discomfort, it's not all going to be easy. There's going to be some really hard decisions to make and your business is likely to change as a result. But look at continuous improvement, one step at a time, and you'll get there. Once you've set strong targets and started doing the work to achieve those targets, you need to be accountable for your impacts. So we suggest that you make public commitments. Tell the world what you're planning to do. Make sure those commitments are true and easy to understand and couldn't be considered as greenwash. Monitor and communicate your progress. Measure well, measure widely. Measure the emissions throughout your value chain as well as your operational um, emissions where you have the, the tools available to do so. Get assurance over your inventory. You want to know that your emissions inventory is robust and of course, Toy2 can help you with that. Work with your supply chain, ask your suppliers to reduce their emissions and plan your logistics and other things well. Avoid emissions and reduce emissions as well as offsetting. As I said, offsetting on its own is not the answer and is no longer acceptable in the market. If you measure and offset and don't reduce, um, you will not be well thought of for that. Do share your learnings so that others can avoid pitfalls and, and learn from each other. As I always said to my children when they were growing up, try to learn from other people's mistakes rather than making them yourselves. 
Uh, and then that means everybody can move faster. Do collaborate, do ask for help. We at Toy2 are here to help and there are lots of resources available. Uh, be transparent, publicly disclose and report your progress. You won't ever get there. Um, you know, there, there is no end finish line for this. It's an ongoing challenge. So report your progress. Um, as the world slowly but surely transitions to focusing on the environmental implications of our consumption habits, it can be tempting for businesses to inflate their, their sustainability credentials. This usually isn't done with bad intent, but can be just as easily done due to a dash of over-enthusiasm. Over as cheesemakers say, good things take time. It takes time to earn environmental credibility, but it can just take one misstep to destroy it. So what about the flip side? What happens if you don't reduce? We believe that um, your competitors will get a, a head start on you. They'll become more efficient. Um, they'll be able to market their achievements. You'll fall further behind and catching up will cost more. You'll need to adapt to more climate change because if a lot of people decide that oh, it's not their job to reduce, that's with somebody else, then we're going to see more climate change. And adapting to climate change is expensive. You may end up with stranded assets, which is where investors don't want to be connected with you. And the value of your, your business could be affected by that. We're already seeing examples of reputational damage. Um, and I'll just quickly cover some of that in a, a bit of detail now. So the corporate climate responsibility mo monitor uh, looks at some of the biggest global companies and to see what they're claiming and what they're actually doing. Um, these 25 companies that they look at have a, a combined revenue uh, in 2020 of 3.2 trillion US dollars, representing about 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Unfortunately, their net zero targets only had them reducing their emissions by about 40% on average, um, not 100% as would have been suggested by the fact that they're making net zero commitment claims. Uh, so they're relying on offsetting as a large part of the solution. And their 2030 targets fall well short of aligning with Paris goals with only 23% planned reduction compared to the 40 to 50% that's required. 19 of the 25 companies assessed by that um, monitor already know that they'll rely on offsetting for their future pledges, and only one company is planning explicitly to achieve net zero without offsets. At least two thirds of those companies rely on carbon dioxide removals from forestry and other biological related carbon sequestration um, to claim future emissions are offset. But those approaches can be considered and are considered by the monitor to be potentially unsuitable for individual offsetting claim because they're risky. Um, biological carbon storage can be reversed and um, also because there's a global requirement to be reducing as well as, um, as offsetting and increasing that carbon storage. So to be very clear, I'm not saying that offsetting is bad. Um, what we're saying is that it's not the long-term strategy and without deep um, emissions reductions, offsetting to achieve global net zero at 2050 will not be possible. Um, I have heard that if we were relying on offsetting alone, we would need seven earths to be planting tr enough trees. And clearly we only have one earth and we want to live on it. So, um, so that's a part of that reasoning there why we need to reduce our emissions substantially. The monitor considered both transparency and integrity of claims being made. The transparency ratings are how easy um, the claims are to understand and to understand what the, the organisation was planning to do. Uh, and the integrity claim is how good those measures are likely to be, are expected to be. You can see that there's a lot of red on this slide. Um, so some, there's some household names across to the right hand side there of companies that you know, are not doing as well as they could be in terms of the transparency and integrity of their claims. None of us wants to be on that list. Um, and if we're on, on the list, we want to be in the green side. No companies have achieved high integrity, according to that monitor. Um, 
only Maersk, an international shipping company, has achieved reasonable integrity. And um, three companies, Apple, Sony, and Vodafone, all names that we know well, um, have achieved moderate integrity scores based on that. So there's room for all of us to improve. I'd like to quickly discuss to finish um, one local example of a company in a sector that has the potential to be badly affected by climate change. Yeelands was the first New Zealand winery to join the International Wineries for Climate Action um, group um, and is committed to those the IWCA targets. Um, the targets of that group are evolving. Um, However, at the moment, the, the key goal is to achieve short-term reductions. Yeelands has also signed up to the United Nations Race to Zero campaign. In achieving the goals that they've committed to, they've, they're committed to around about a 5% annual emissions reduction as a pathway to 2030. They're currently in year two of those um, targets. Year one achieved, well done, and year two is tracking well to date. Some of the things that Yearlands is doing, um, they have reduced their fuel use uh, by about 15% in their first year of this um, program by um, changing vineyard operations, um, changing spray, spray regimes, reducing tractor use. They have for some time been doing offshore bottling, making sure that their bottling is happening in or as close to market as possible. Uh, light weighting their bottles, um, so they're using the lightest weight glass that they can and removing um, carton container di dividers, the, the cardboard dividers within the boxes uh, from some wine ra ranges um, to reduce their freight emissions and packaging materials. Um, where they can, they're sourcing glass as local to the bottling facility as they can. Um, but it's not easy. You know, with supply chain issues globally, it is not a, an easy challenge to solve. In waste and compost, um, they have a, a facility on site near their winery um, so that they don't need to transport their, their waste off site um, of their grape mark. 25% of their energy um, is generated on site through solar, wind, and through burning um, vine prunings that would otherwise go to landfill. Uh, for their solar, they have a lease arrangement for solar panels. Um, they don't store uh, their energy at this stage from their solar panels, so excess is going to the grid. Uh, and up to 10% of the vineyard vine prunings are baled, stored, and dried and burnt each year. Um, if you've been to Yearlands, which I've been fortunate to do a couple of times, you may have seen their native plantings across the 1,000 hectare plus property. Um, they've got a mix of existing vegetated areas that they're working on and new plantings for, for biodiversity and previously for beautification around the property. So the focus from now on is planting natives for environmental restoration and for biodiversity. Um, the 2021 20, financial year was the first year that they included those removals in their footprint. Um, and in future years, they're going to be including the new the emissions removals around the new plantings um, and on their footprint too, to get a good sense on the benefits that that's having. So Yearlands is doing some really great work now while they work out the next steps in their decarbonisation journey. And some of those things may seem small, but they all help. Every single action that's taken um, contributes to where we need to get to. Now, in closing, this whakatoki seems very relevant to me in thinking about climate change. The literal translation relates to damage to a waka, but it can be interpreted to mean it's not a small problem, but a total disaster, and that we must accept the evidence in front of us rather than ignoring the information just because it makes us uncomfortable. The photos here are all from the past 12 months and all from places around New Zealand, from Southland, from West Coast, from the East Cape and from Wellington. Um, so the evidence is here and it is uncomfortable, but we need to respond to it. Dr. Hinamoa Elder in her book Aroha suggests that this week we should write a letter to our grandchildren or to other children that will be born in 2050 about what we did to stop the demise of the world and when we started to change. I encourage you to think about what your letter would say. 
I will now hand over to Danny to coordinate our Q&A and give my voice a very short rest. Thank you, Belinda. Tino Pai, that was most impressive and thorough. So a good spread of um, topics covered there. So that's really great to see. The question and answer um, tab has been running hot. I have been managed managed to answer a handful of questions along the way. Um, there's only so many I can, I can get to at once. Um, and quite a few of you have been making use of the upvote uh, tool. So the uh, question I'd like to uh, answer here um, from Simon Drzowski. Uh, kia ora host, thank you for this webinar. Given that biochar can sequester carbon in soil for hundreds of years, is there any reason why carbon credits still cannot be claimed for biochar produced from rapid rotation biomass? Biofuel precursors are another valuable byproduct of the pyrolysis process. It seems like the right thing to do for lifting rates of atmospheric carbon drawdown without locking up land and forestry. That is a very good question. And I believe Stu McKenzie is on hand to be able to answer that one. I'm not sure whether Stu has his camera on at this point. But... If he doesn't, I do have his a short written response that I can provide, I believe. That um, that, uh, so that biochar, it is getting attention from international credit standards such as Gold Standard and Vera. Uh, it's also being considered in measure guidance such as greenhouse gas protocol land sector accounting which is currently in development so that's there answer. are a number of areas um, like biochar that are um, they're likely to come along soon i expect that uh, because we need to be super robust in what we do sometimes it does take a little longer than we would like to um, get that certainty um, and be able to use those credits. But in the meantime, we know that it's doing good, so keep doing it. Would you like to add anything more to that, Stu, if you've, uh, I think you've joined in? Uh, yeah, right, good day. Yeah, no, that, I covered that in the answer and I don't have anything else to, to say, sorry. Um, that's pretty much, we're just tracking biochar and there is a lot of work on it. Okay, useful. Uh, the next question we'll go through is uh, from Nigel Brunnell. Um, any thoughts on GWP in particular, GWP 100 versus GWP star, um, so GWP being global warming potential, there is increasing um, science backing the use of GWP star in addition to other measures. Yes, um, so GWP star is something that we're trying to get our head around at Toitu. Um, be very happy to have conversation with Nigel or others about that. Um, the slight challenge that we're facing um, as an organisation is that the standards that our programmes are based on do require reporting based on the 100 year global warming potentials, um, you can report other things as well. So we have to use that GWP 100 um, for standards aligned reporting, um, but we're looking at GWP star as an option for, for other, um, you know, an additional reporting methodology. Great, thanks, Belinda. Um, a question from Anonymous. Would you be able to comment on the usefulness of comparing emissions per capita when our emissions are measured on a production basis, not a consumption basis, i.e. many of our agricultural <laughs> emissions are to produce food that is consumed by people around the world, but the emissions sit with us. I wonder about this in terms of designing actions to reduce these emissions. Yeah, and that's a really um, an interesting thing to be thinking about. We are starting to think about the um, consumption-based emissions, and I know Stats New Zealand um, issues some information about consumption-based emissions as well. Um, one of the challenges to think about in that is, um, and it, it potentially adds to the question rather than answering it, um, is the fact that some of the things that we're doing in New Zealand in our farming systems are really efficient. And um, if we stop doing them and stopped doing this farming, um, then the emissions might, global emissions might result, might increase as a result. So yes, I think there is absolutely a, a place for consumption-based reporting. Um, it has not been found to be easy at national level, but um, thinking about it within your business um, 
absolutely you can take responsibility for the emissions associated with the things that you're buying um, and the things that you're consuming as a company and um, you're taking also responsibility um, if you're doing really broad measurement and reduction to the things that you're making and the things that of yours that other people are buying so yeah it, it's a complex area but it is definitely part of the picture Nate, thank you for that. Um, another question here from Melanie. Thanks, Belinda. Can you clarify on the 41% gross reduction? Did you say some of that will come from overseas offset purchases? Yeah, I'm sorry. I think I probably didn't explain that as well as I could have. Um, so the, what I was trying to say effectively, excuse me, my voice is going, <coughs> um, was that the, the change in our our target setting um, was one was on a gross basis, one was on a net basis, and I was trying to put them into um, into you know, in, into context with each other. And yes, absolutely, purchasing emissions offset um, overseas um, will be a, a, a different proposition. So yeah, it's, sorry if I didn't talk about that very clearly. Uh, it's quite all right. Um... Okay, so another one here from Paul Costa. Toitu allows businesses to offset their carbon emissions by supporting international renewable electricity generation project, projects. Has Toitu considered helping businesses to reduce emissions via New Zealand's renewable projects? Um, yes, we, we would really like to be able to do that. Um, we're very closely monitoring how the voluntary carbon market works within New Zealand. One of the, the key matters, and Paul and um, sorry, Stu may want to make some comment in addition to what I say, but um, the technology based reductions um, largely in New Zealand are all sitting within the emissions trading scheme, which means that it's not. Um, meeting the, the international required um, principle of additionality. So because it's um, fitting within that um, national reporting as well. So um, we would love to see ways that um, carbon credits for technology projects could be issued in New Zealand where they're outside the ETS. Um, at the moment, there isn't really a facility that's allowing that for us. So, um, but it is something that we're monitoring and we're having some active discussions about. Great, um, I've got another question here from another anonymous attendee. Hi there, with the government target of being net zero by 2050, what will happen to the voluntary carbon market, i.e. why would I purchase credits to offset my business, business's emissions if my emissions will already be offset through the emissions trading scheme? So there's a big part of the question there is um, now versus 2050. So um, in 2050, there will be far few, fewer opportunities to um, offset. Um, to buy carbon credits, which is why we need to be reducing our emissions, because as more and more people are aiming to get to that, there will be much more demand for um, for those emissions uh, for those projects. So at the moment, um, things that are outside the emissions trading scheme can um, be a really useful part of that that voluntary carbon market in offsetting immediate emissions. Um, but moving forward, there will be some changes there. Stu, have you got anything further to add to that? No, that's good, good, Belinda. Um, uh, the, the, <laughs> just to summarise, it's uh, voluntary offsetting and your carbon performance claims does require you to go beyond regulatory requirements. And that's, uh, that's quite a key uh, lead practice uh, criteria that's consistent across all international sort of claims guidance, including the International Carbon Reduction and Offset Alliance that Toyota is a member of. Excellent, thank you. Uh, anonymous attendee is on an absolute roll and has another question. We are, where are we at in terms of soil being considered as a credible carbon sink option? Does Toyota recognize it under their carbon reduce or carbon zero certification schemes? Stu, is that one for, for you or one for me? Uh, generally, soil, look, Toitu is willing to accept various um, 
removal based uh, options, including soil, and, and I'll see there's a few questions around different forest types and things. Um, but it really comes down to can it be measured? Uh, once things get uh, suitable in terms of robust method, measurement methods and verification methods, uh, then you know it can come into the mix. And there's a number of um, standards and uh, accounting methodologies that are being developed um, to address these sort of areas. Because coming back to the comment around renewable energy uh, technology-based carbon credits, for example, uh, we anticipate a shift away from those because as regular, as countries start regulating out things like coal-fired electricity generation, the voluntary carbon market in particular will start wanting to find other options to reduce emissions because as soon as coal is regulated out, there's less way to demonstrate additionality in those renewable energy scenarios. Right, we've got, a, got one here from Nick Jolly. Uh, thanks for the webinar, it's been really interesting. Dave Frame and Adrian Macy have argued that if we achieve the current Zero Carbon Act range, the calling from methane reductions will more than mask the warming from emissions of long-lived gases, meaning that New Zealand will no longer be warming the climate by 2040. This is much sooner than comparable economies such as the US, the UK, European Union countries and Japan. When you talk about science-based targets using the latest science, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on the use of GWP100 and GWP star to meet the climate neutral or no new warming target. Yes. Um, so yeah, as I, I touched on before, that um, there is a lot of science happening in this space at the moment. We're doing our best to make sure that we understand it and that we can provide tools for um, businesses to incorporate really robust um, science into their, their footprinting. So as we uh, develop our, our thinking further, um, we absolutely will update our programs to include that sort of stuff. And if anybody has um, feedback for us or would like to, to talk to us about those things, very pleased to have those conversations. Nate, I got one here from Benjamin Walsh. Uh, are you seeing many businesses set targets and gross emissions reductions rather than net? Um, Stu has actually just replied to I see saying, yes, all businesses in the Toy 2 programs, for example, have to report reductions against gross emissions. So that one's been covered off. Um, have another one here. Um, could you speak a bit more? This is from Guess who? Anonymous. Uh, would you speak a bit more to the problems of offsetting emissions with planting forestry? I notice Ministry of the Environment guidance does not provide emissions factors for trees dying. Uh, I can take that one. So um, this is, sort of relates to the permanence of the, uh, the carbon credit or the removal you're claiming. Uh, it's prevalent, uh, well, it's relevant for both nature-based solutions and also the emerging engineered carbon capture type technologies. Um, but in, in the forest sense, it's about having your forest, if, if you're going through a carbon credit uh, option, it's about demonstrating that your forest is going to be permanent and that you've got procedures in place to manage that risk. So if you've got trees dying, well, uh, to maintain the permanence, you want to have... Um, a strategy for actually replacing those dead trees. Uh, there's also an element of um, measurement here as well, of course. So actually measuring what the flux of carbon is in any given year. And so that you're only claiming the carbon that's being removed in the year, um, net of any uh, dead trees. Hope that makes sense. Well covered. Got one here from Yi Petrus. It was mentioned in your presentation that government, business, and individuals have a role to play. Totally agree. I just wondered what your thoughts are around the role of philanthropic organizations can play in this space. That's a really good question. That is um, good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, absolutely. There's there's roles to be be played there. Um, uh, there is a lot of stuff that. Um, that organizations want to do or um, you know things that everybody thinks is a good idea but nobody quite has worked out how to fund yet so you know potentially there is space um, for philanthropic organizations to be funding innovation um, to be funding the things that might be um, too early development for um, organizations to be able to fund on their own 
I'll just jump in and I'll just jump in and do a little plug for our Toy Two Climate Positive program as well. So what Blinda's just described there um, slots into uh, an area that we call impact contribution, which is going beyond your value chain and um, looking at uh, the, the wider options of um, technology, etc. As Blinda outlined. Nice. Um, have one here from D Rossiter. Any idea about hard to abate industries such as hard coking coal used for steel manufacturing and low emissions replacement technologies? Di, asking the difficult questions. Um, I worked with Di for several years. So yes, there are some, um, some challenges there and technology is one of those big challenges that's um, hard to to work your way through. I know that there is work going on in, in a number of areas on how we can come up with lower um, low emissions technologies for some of those things. Um, and I guess that's one of those things that might be later in the, the pathway rather than sooner. So I don't have specific answers for you. I'm sorry, Di. If you're interested, there's a good podcast put out by BBC Costing You Earth recently, recently talking about Sweden and um, what they've been doing about looking at uh, low carbon steel. And uh, it's, quite, it's an interesting podcast because it talks about the opportunities, but also the uh, the do no harm impacts that Linda highlighted previously. Have another question here from Simon. Kia ora, uh, Belinda. How does Toy2 view work by firms such as Carbon Crop that allow lifestyle blocks with planting over one hectare in size to generate carbon credits? Thank you. Simon, I'd like to hear more about Carbon Crop. Um, it's not a, an initiative that I'm um, really aware of. I don't know whether Stu is or not. Um, something interesting happening in Danny's office by the look of it. Um, fire alarm. Sorry. Oh, super. Um, so the, there are some yeah, potential opportunities there. Challenges with the, the carbon credits um, for programs like ours. We um, work with pro, uh, carbon credits, or we, we use carbon credits that are issued by um, international registries uh, like Vera. Um, so there can be some cost implications that uh, make it really difficult for smaller projects. Um, Stu, if you've got anything to add there, and we often we'll say, well, it might be possible, but there might be a, a big grouping or something that needs to happen to make those. Yeah, things. a lot of this actually comes back, back down to the pointy end of what you want to claim and achieve. Okay, so there's, there's various carbon credit type initiatives um, popping up around the place. Um, and they've all got a role to play in terms of um, helping with the efforts. Um, but then just be careful about you know, what you want to communicate. So there's this thing called double counting. Um, and you just need to be aware of you know, when you make some claims, what's, what's it covering? Is, um, is there any other sort of considerations there? Um, coming back to Belinda's point, so the way Toy2 operates is we want to use credits that are endorsed by ICROA. Uh, which is that international alignment. Um, but you know, if, if you're looking for a different purpose of your end claim, um, then look at these other options as well. We've got time for a couple more. Sorry about before, um, a fire alarm of some sort went off and then stopped going off. So <laughs> that's, why, that's why I had to look a bit panicked. Um, I have one from Kim Yung. I noticed the net zero, uh, so the net zero pathway is at odds with the climate neutral now initiative. Would it not be better if um, we are carbon neutral now with offsetting and reduce along with carbon neutral journey? The end result is the same, but the net emissions are zero at the start rather at the end in 2050. Yep. Um, Stu, do you want to answer that or shall I? Oh, yep. Look, there's a lot of different terminal. Sorry, there's a lot of different terms being used, and then even the same term has a lot of different definitions by different uh, entities. Um, so we see the Science Based Targets Initiative as being the sort of lead framework for good definition in terms of net zero by 2050 or sooner. Um, and then SBTI says, well, look, um, claims up on your journey along to 2050 you're doing your compensation or offsetting, um, but the neutrality concept that doesn't come in until 2050. So there is a lot of work here. 
Um, the other comment would be, be, be clear about your claim, um, have a lot of narrative behind it and be transparent about what you've achieved. Uh, our carbon jargon webinar talks about that a lot more. <clears throat> Okay, um, that's all we have time for today. That's a, a great array of questions there. Sorry if um, we're unable to answer some of them. Uh, just to reiterate that this um, webinar will, the video will be, you'll be able to uh, view that at a later date and the slides will also be available at a later date. So they should be emailed out. So thank you again for taking your time and attention to, to join us on another fine webinar today. So. Yeah, we really appreciate that you're able to attend and, and hear more about what um, what these best better targets look like as well as following through on that. And we look to see more of it. We know it's going to be uncomfortable, but you know, we've got Gene Baden and, and Ed Hillary for you to, to follow through with. So thank you again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next one.